Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here at Cultish. And I'm Andrew, the Super Sleuth. Hey, so we are here at the end of the year. This is our last episode of the year. It's a conversation we had with Ray Comfort talking about how to witness to the kingdom of the cults. Uh, before we jump into that podcast, uh, we are at the end of the year. Uh, this is a ministry that is uh, supported by you. So if you are interested in uh, supporting Cultish, uh, please go to the, the cultishshow.com forward slash donate you can donate one time or become a monthly partner with us and all donations are tax deductible andrew tell everyone about the landscape of where we are now and what we need as far as the ministry going into 2023 yeah where we're at right now is that we need more people to partner with us into 2023 right now currently about one percent of our listener base do donate so we need to increase that amount so we can get more content for you guys and we're very excited about the plans that we have coming in 2023 we're, we barely just scratched the surface yeah absolutely in fact not just for the content to continue but the only way for the content to uh, be released on a weekly basis is that if we have that support increase so again we would uh, ask you prayerfully consider that uh, if you want to support cultish you can make a tax deductible donation by the end of the year or you can become a monthly partner with us go to the cultishshow.com forward slash donate and uh, we're, we're trusting that we're going to get the support that we need and continue more content like this conversation with our good friend friend ray comfort from living waters all right welcome back ladies and gentlemen to cultish entering the kingdom of the cults my name is jeremiah roberts i'm one of the co-hosts here uh, very super excited today uh, with the guests we have with us today uh, i'm joined as always by andrew the super sleuth of the show how are you doing man I'm doing well, doing well. About to find out if I'm a good person or not. I know yes. I'm not, and I need the Lord. So, <laughs> no, absolutely, man. So, uh, well. we are here with Ray Comfort uh, from Living Waters Ministries. Ray, thanks for so much for coming on. Great. Is my beard lacking? It doesn't seem to be as long as your guys' beards. Oh, no. I think uh, I noticed that uh, you, you're pretty much infamous for your mustache, actually. Uh, so, I noticed you're kind of really Still growing there. in a full it's thing. It's just, yeah, it's just hidden. Still yeah. <laughs> no, nah, it's really, no, nah, beards are really like the matter of the heart. You know, sometimes some people can grow them great and glorious. Other people just have patches. So it just really all depends. As long as your heart's in the right place, you know, you're pretty good. Um, right. But yeah, so we are here with us. We want to kind of have you on because we, our show, uh, Cultish, we deal a lot with uh, different uh, cults and world religions, uh, aspects of the new age, aspects of the occult. Uh, and I, we want to reach out to you just because you have a ministry long and running. Uh, just real quickly, tell everyone just about yourself and your ministry, uh, specifically with Living Waters and the things that you do real quickly. Well, to make it succinct, we encourage Christians to go back to the biblical gospel and we, um, we tell them principles that help them share their faith, principles of addressing the conscience of doing what Jesus did, imitating what Christ did, what the apostle Paul did, looking at scripture and say, what are we doing wrong according to scripture? And so we, we equip the body of Christ to effectively share the gospel, basically. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And so we just want to kind of get into it. So you have done this for several decades now, just going on the street, going around, um, just talking to people from all sorts of different worldviews, different world religions. And so we just kind of want to hear from you just about kind of your experiences just being on the street. And also we'll talk later on just about some of the things you're doing now with your ministry here at Living Waters. When it comes to different cults and world religions, let's just kind of jump into it. Who do you think you've had the most encounters with? I know there's videos of you talking with like Harry Krishnas, um, like thinking about like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, uh, you have mediums, all sorts of different people. Like wh who do you think... What, who have you talked? Who have you encountered most commonly uh, when it comes to the world of the kingdom of the cult, specifically in evangelism on the street? Boy, it's uh, usually Mormons more than anything else, I guess. So then there's New Age and Huntington Beach is a lot of New Age people, Southern California. It's basically just idolatry when it comes down to it. People have a wrong image of God's nature and character. Even atheists are idolaters. They don't realize it. Yeah. Idolatrous. Uh, the chief pope of idolatry would be Richard Dawkins. He created a concept of God, which is totally erroneous. He put all the nasty things he could find about the Lord in the Old Testament and shaped this monster. Mm -hmm. And uh, with no sense of justice or truth or love or mercy, 
and just all the harsh judgments of God and says, oh, that's your God, I don't, don't want anything to do with him. But the God that Richard Dawkins doesn't believe in doesn't exist. He's a figment of his imagination, shaped mm-hmm. to conform to his own sins. Yeah. And so uh, when it comes to all the cults, all the atheists, all the uh, agnostics, it comes back to the old sin of idolatry, which plagued Israel in the Old Testament. It was so prevalent, God saw fit to address it in the first two of the Ten Commandments. I am mm-hmm. the Lord your God. You have no other gods before me. You should not make yourself a graven image of any likeness yeah. of anything. And so people shape a God, not just with their hands, but with their minds. And that image of God is what shapes the way they walk, whether or not they fear God. Mm-hmm. And that's what, that's what motivates the cult. Uh, whether it be Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, whatever, they don't see God as being so righteous that they can't please him. So you've got the the Mormon who says it's grace after all he can do. Right. The same with Jehovah's Witness. It's all to do with good works because what Jesus did on the cross wasn't good enough. When he said it was finished, he wasn't finished. Same with the Catholics. Yeah. Come, let's go back to it. You, you talked about cults, and I don't know if I want to call Catholicism a cult. I'll leave it up to you, but that's the most common uh, person I speak with as a, as a Roman Catholic. Well, they'll, they'll identify themselves as Roman Catholic, uh, um, even if they're living in t- total rebellion to the Roman Catholic Church, they still tie themselves to it. So I'm mm-hmm. a Catholic. I was born a Catholic. My yeah. family Catholic. I don't go to church, but I'm a Catholic. And so they're... Uh, they're the most common ones, I would say for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would you say? Because I think a lot of people, when they look, they look at you and they they see you as some sort of uh, evangelist rock star. You have this special ability that no one else has. And given, you know, you're in me- people are in media, so that now you can have like an online persona. Um, and also, a lot of people sometimes think they have to become an expert on every single cult or world religion in order to confront them or share their faith with them. Like, how do you, what would you say to those people who think they have to be someone super special uh, to in order to go do an evangelism, talk with a cult, or just talk with someone from another worldview? And also, but how would you also address someone who feels like overwhelmed? Like, I have to know every little tidbit of Mormonism before I share my faith with them. How would you respond to that? There's two questions in one. Remind me if I don't get to the second one, which is how to respond to someone who's got all these doctrines that I think I should learn about. First thing is about the rock star thing. It's like looking at a marathon runner that breaks the tape. Is it 28 miles and bursts through the tape and you run up to him and say, yeah, whoa, you are so gifted. He's going to turn to you indignantly and say, what are you talking about? Gifted. See these muscles? That's from running 30 or 40 miles a week. See this physique? I haven't touched chocolate or anything with sugar in it for years. I've denied myself. I've fallen over, I've bruised myself. It's been hard work, sweat and pain to get where I got today. It's not a gifting. It's something I achieved because I wanted to achieve it. <clears throat> and you look at me, break the tape and say, whoa, he is just so gifted. No, I'm full of sweat, pain and suffering to get where I've got. Mm. I've bruised my knees. I've, I've fallen over. I've put my foot in my mouth. Uh, the image is quite interesting. I put my foot in my mouth. I've done things that are wrong, and that's got me to where I am. And that means that you can also get here. You can be a marathon runner if you want to. You can build up your own muscle if you want to. You can deny yourself if you want to to get the point to get to the point where you break the tape. And so don't be discouraged, be encouraged. Many things in life that you did, you did because you wanted to do them. You you began crawling as a baby. You didn't lie on your back for the rest of your life and stay there. You turn over and you crawled. You don't remember it. Right. And then when you wanted to get up and walk, you began walking. You fell over and hit yourself. You don't mm-hmm. remember it. Yeah. You wanted to ride a bike. You got on a bike. You got momentum. You fell off a lot, but you finally did it when you got in a car. You did it because you wanted to do it. You're in fear and trembling at first, and then you became confident confident and you did all those things because you wanted to do them and so when it comes to evangelism if you want to be proficient in sharing your faith you've got to just do it you've got to get on the bike you've got to get in the car you've got to stand up you've got to forget about yourself and say i'm not going to be worried about what people think of me i'm going to be worried about where they're going to spend eternity that's how you'll grow in 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 your uh and your abilities god's created us to do that and every Mm. other area it's exactly the same in evangelism second thing about knowing the doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and New Age, you don't need to know that. I'll tell you why. They've all got one thing in common. They're all works, righteousness, religions. As I said, they've got a wrong concept of what God is like, and they think they can bridge the gap between them and God by doing things. 
whether it be facing Mecca, fasting and praying, doing good works, taking the mass, whatever it is, they think they can please God by doing that. All you have to do is learn how to do what Jesus did and annihilate their self-righteousness. You've got to learn to take away from them the parachute that's filled with holes that they're trusting in. And you do that by doing what Jesus did with the rich young ruler. Mm -hmm. Rich young ruler said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What should I do? He thought he could do something. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. God mm -hmm. is utterly morally perfect. That's what it means to be good. Yeah. That's what God's book says. And then he used the Ten Commandments to annihilate his self-righteousness. He said, you know the commandments. And he named five commandments and then snuck one in the middle that I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Right in the middle of five commandments that he named, he said, do not extort. Why would he say that to a young rich man? Do not extort. Mm -hmm. Would it be that he wasn't the good man that he was made himself out to be? Yeah. That he got his riches by extortion? It would seem that way. Why would Jesus bring it up? Yeah. And he went away sorrowful because he was rich, because he got his money illegitimately, and money was his God. Mm -hmm. And Jesus destroyed his false hope. And that's what we have to do. Just go through the commandments. Say, do you think you're a good person? Yeah, I'm a really good person. And then say, how many lies you told? Ever stolen something? Ever used God's name in vain? Yeah. Ever uh, looked at a woman with lust? When you do that, commit adultery in the heart. That destroys self-righteousness. That takes away from them false hope to a point when they'll come out saying, what then should I do? What must I do? Yeah. Give, him his, give him his own personal earthquake. as what happened with the um, Philippian jailer. Mm -hmm. So he turns and said, what shall I do to be saved? Yeah. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by HigherBond.com. I am getting married soon, but if I wasn't, I'd be checking out HigherBond.com. It's a brand new Christian dating website that takes out a lot of the awkward nuance of online dating. They have a lot of really cool features to bring back the human element into the online dating scene. One of the cool things they have is something called Guided first messages, which makes the initial sliding into the direct messages. We all know how uncomfortable that can be. They've actually made that process extremely fun for both people involved and made a really fun, natural, organic way to date online to meet new people. And check it out. They currently are offering a three-month uh, trial, no credit card required. And who knows? You might find yourself uh, a wife, a husband, a hubby. A uh, significant other, whatever you're looking for, you can find it at higherbond.com. You can go ahead and take advantage of the three month trial. Enjoy the podcast. Andrew, what questions do you have for Ray uh, as we're jumping into this conversation? Yeah, I'm wondering for out of, out of all the decades you've been doing uh, evangelism, how, how have you seen the culture in America sway? Uh, how, where do you see it headed even uh, going further on in the future? Well, it's got worse. Obviously, things have got far darker. Any kid at the age of nine or 10 can have access uh, to hardcore pornography. And what that's done is made them hate the light. The darker it is, the more they're going to hate the light. But where sin abounds, there does much more grace abound. Let me share with you a couple of my most powerful weapons, if I may, when it comes to sharing the gospel. One is the sinner's conscience. He has a knowledge of right and wrong. When I bring up the commandments, the Judge on the courtroom of his mind, the work of the law written upon his heart, bears witness with the commandments. When I say you shall not steal, he knows he should not steal. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say you shall not lie, he intuitively knows he should not lie. It's wrong. Morally, written upon his heart. Yeah. With a point of a, with a point of a diamond. So that's my that's my confidence. I know this person is not ignorant of right and wrong. He may have dulled his conscience. But we can resurrect it. We can say, come forth, stinking yeah. Lazarus, conscience that has been covered up, and it'll do its duty mm -hmm. because it's God-given. The second thing, and this is such an important thing, and it's one I think is overlooked by many, is that this sinner has a will to live. Something in him says, oh, I don't want to die. So what I do when I talk to sinners is just say this. Ever read the Bible? I say, no. So, you know, it's the world's biggest selling book of all time. Mm -hmm. Do you know what this message is? And they say, not really. I say, well, in the Old Testament, God promised to destroy death. And in the New Testament, he tells us how he did it. Yeah. That immediately puts salt on the tongue. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been said you can't lead a horse to water 
uh, you, can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's just not true because you can salt the oats. Mm -hmm. You can make him desire water. You can create a thirst in him by putting salt everywhere. Yeah. And you can create a desire in the heart of the most hardened person by appealing to their will to live. Now, let mm -hmm. me digress just a little and say, I eat poached eggs. I don't know. You guys know what poached eggs are? Yes. Okay, good. I don't have to explain it. Sometimes Americans say, fried egg? Yeah. Poached eggs <laughs> boil in water. And for years, I've had a problem. Um, that is, you get fluff on the top of the poached egg when you boil it. It's mm -hmm. like the stuff we use for meringues. It's just fluff. And you have to scoop it away, and then you don't know what to do with it off the spatula, put it down the drain, or take it over and drip it everywhere. It's just annoying. But one day... A couple of years ago, I put the lid on the frying pan and something amazing happened. The egg cooked 10 times quicker and there was no fluff. And it was all because of the pressure. Mm -hmm. So keep that on your taste buds while we go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Think of the thief on the cross and say, why was it that this thief blasphemed Jesus? That's what the Bible says. And he riled against him or railed against him. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into kingdom. What brought about the change? I believe there was a hidden truth there. Number one, he had a knowledge of sin. He was not, as some people say, just an ignorant guy turning to Jesus and getting saved. No, no. He was a thief. He knew he had violated the, the eighth commandment. He said, we're here justly. He wasn't saying the Romans are justified in nailing us to crosses. Mm -hmm. He was saying we're dying justly, I believe, because he knew he had violated God's law. He was a Jew, I'd say, being crucified, not a Roman. And so what was it that caused him to change from being hardened to being, being very soft? I believe it was pressure. Mm -hmm. The pressure caused the fluff to surface. You see, most people know they're going to die sometime in the future. But what this guy on the cross suddenly realized he is going to be dead really quick. The Romans were going to come, break his legs, and suddenly he'd be in eternity facing God. Mm -hmm. That caused him to get rid of the fluff, to get rid of the things that didn't matter. It doesn't matter yeah. who you marry. doesn't matter about your vocation. doesn't matter about your wealth. What matters is that death is coming and what's going to happen to you after you die. Mm -hmm. That's because you're not a beast. You've, God has written eternity upon your heart. There's something new that says, I don't want to die. That was pressured up and sped up for the thief on the cross because he couldn't go anywhere. He was crucified, couldn't do anything with his hands. He was utterly helpless before death. That's what the sinner feels like, and that's what we can speed up, and that's what's happened with COVID. Before COVID, we had millions of people that thought death was a long way away. Don't even think about it. But yeah. COVID, everyone realized that death, is right at the doorstep. It's a, mm -hmm. it's the grim reaper with his hand on our shoulder. All of us, we can be right. taken any moment. That has been good for evangelism mm -hmm. because it's caused a lot of people to get rid of the fluff. So when I meet someone, and I'll be going to the local college again today, I'll go up to someone and say, do you think there's an afterlife? That's how I begin after I get the permission to interview them. And they say, I don't know. Say, I say, you're afraid of dying. And suddenly you see their eyes widen like I've just looked into their soul and I've asked them a question yeah. that have never been asked, but it's a question that's plagued them. They have mentioned to mom, dad, brother, sister, friend, but there's something in them that haunts them. Hebrews 2 verse 14, 15 says, every human being is haunted, haunted by the fear of death all their lifetime. That's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And so we can tap into that doesn't matter who people are we can destroy their self-righteousness using the law and appeal to their will to will to live by saying that jesus destroyed death and yeah. brought life and immortality light through the gospel so if mm. only the world knew what we had in christ let me know if i'm talking too much I just no this is this is really no this is really good ray a question i have for you uh i and i'm Hang i just on, let, don't, don't let me digress i'll just finish what i was saying oh, you're thought. Uh -huh. Think of a waitress in a restaurant as she, she sees three men wearing three-piece suits, carrying little important-looking cases up to a table, and they sit there and begin wheeling and dealing, obviously, millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. She doesn't feel at all intimidated because she knows she has what they want. She'll walk straight up to these businessmen while they're talking and say, can I take your order? Yeah. She just butts in. Why? Because she knows she has what they want. 
they are there for food. And so she's bold because of that. And what we've, we've got to realize as Christians is that we have what the world wants more than anything else, everlasting life. They just don't realize that. That's mm -hmm. what Jesus said to the woman at the well, John chapter 3. If you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you'd ask him, and he'd give you living water. So to sum it, uh, summary is that I have a, a, a boldness because I know the sinner has a conscience. The work of the Lord is in his heart, and I have a boldness because I know I have what this person wants. They have a will to live. God has written eternity upon the heart, so I tap into both those things, and that's what makes evangelism so uniquely effective mm -hmm. by just copying what the scriptures say. Uh, no, thank you, Ray. Uh, speaking of effective evangelism, I just uh, recalled uh, listening to some of your old tapes a long, long time ago, and you were giving tactics of evangelism. And I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm sure you're going to remember this. You would talk specifically about when you are on the street not to wear sunglasses when talking to someone, but you connected it to a specific cult leader. Uh, tell us about that, if you can. Yeah, that's that's usually while I'm open air preaching, I'll take my sunglasses off. Sometimes we'll pull in a crowd wearing sunglasses, but we always take them off. And the reason for it is just common um, decency, really. To, if you're preaching the gospel, you let people see your eyes. Remember one guy who I really respect jumped up when I was open air preaching and began speaking to a crowd on a sunny day. And he has sunglasses on. And a guy in the crowd yelled out, don't you dare preach to me while wearing sunglasses. And we know Jim Jones, the cult leader, who, by the way, was an atheist. He yep. was not a Christian. According to the FBI, he was an atheist. So he's on their side, not ours. Yeah. He always wore sunglasses. I wear sunglasses often when I interview people because my eye specialist says, you've got really good eyesight. If you want to keep your eyesight, make sure you wear sunglasses. So often I'll say to someone, do you mind if I wear sunglasses? But usually in Southern California, the person I'm speaking to is wearing sunglasses anyway. So uh, um, we get away with it because of the culture. Mm -hmm. a Andrew, what, uh, what additional questions do you have when it comes to evangelizing uh, the world of the cults, the world of the occult? I mean, you do that regularly on Thursday nights up there in Utah. Uh, what's on your mind, Andrew? What are you thinking? Yeah, I love, I love what you're saying, Ray. Essentially, uh, regardless of someone's background, regardless of where someone comes from, what cult they're in, what we do is we use the word of God because the word of God never returns void. Uh, God knows the positions of people's hearts, right? So we appeal to that. Like the wages of sinner is death. Uh, God puts eternity in the hearts of men. So what we need to do is appeal to what God's word says about them. Like Ray, what Ray said is we need to uh, say they're going to die, right? The wages of sin is death. They're sinners. And the solution is the gospel. Uh, my, my question for you, Ray, is how can you uh, challenge some, maybe, some, maybe even some of our listeners that are scared to go preach the gospel, right? They're scared of that, that boldness. You, you referenced that marathon uh, runner earlier, just like breaking the tape. And it reminded me of a uh, second Peter chapter one, verse five through eight. I'll just read it real quick. It says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective, unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's an effort that's being made, just like the marathon runner who has denied sugar, who has been training their body for years. So when they get through the tape, it's like, well, I've been working, working out my salvation with fear and trembling, essentially. So what, what, what could you say, Ray, to the, the Christian that may be unfruitful right now in that side of their lives? How can you challenge them to get uh, more steadfast in their faith and to preach the gospel? Talking about fear, how do I overcome fears? Well, I, I get fear every time. Uh, yesterday, I had a, um, one of the most fearful things I had to do. I was invited to the Dr. Phil show to talk about the Bible and the Antichrist. And uh, yeah, I saw I your post about that. So, yeah, I was so nervous. You wouldn't believe how nervous I was. I usually really enjoy breakfast. I didn't enjoy my mm -hmm. breakfast yesterday one bit. Yeah. Because I, I, I've been invited on the show as a member of the audience that was mic'd up. So it was legitimate for me to speak, but I had to butt in and bring in the things of God into natural conversation. And it was, kind of nerve wracking when I'm open air preaching, I know where I'm going. And if I'm with Christians, you introduce me. I wasn't even introduced. I just had to cold Turkey. So I was very nervous. Yeah. It's very quick. It was just for one minute. Um, but I got to be with a producer who was a Christian, prayed with her 
and gave her a book called How to Be Free from the Fear of Death and suggested doing a program. And she agreed that'd be a great thing to do, especially if a doctor would fill, mm-hmm. because the fear of death plagues so many people, as I said. So I have fears. I have fears when I approach anyone, but I, I, I liken it to a firefighter. You think of a firefighter who arrives at a fire and he's expecting to just put out a little sort of beach fire, but he looks at an apartment and looks up the fifth story. There's a woman and two children leaning out of a window, screaming in horror because she's going to burn to death any, any moment. So he's got to get up a ladder 60 feet tall. And he's got to reach out and take those kids. And is he horrified and terrified? Absolutely. He'd rather be home with his wife and kids watching a, an old black and white movie or something rather than be here doing this climbing up a 60 foot ladder when there's flames everywhere and a woman screaming. But what he does is he remembers he's a firefighter and he doesn't listen to his fears. He doesn't think about himself. He thinks about that woman and her fate and the fate of her two children. Mm -hmm. That's the key. When I approach someone, I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about their fate. If they die in their sins, they're not going to a Christless eternity. They're not going to eternal separation from God. They're going to a very real hell and a lake of fire. And that breaks my heart. And so that's my motivation. Others, having compassion, making a difference, pulling them from the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, Mm -hmm. Jude, I think, 23. So that's the key. Forget about yourself. Let love swallow your fears. Mm -hmm. If if I could say to you, would you ever jump into a pond that was packed full of ice that was so cold, you'd die within two minutes of exposure? You say, no, I never jump in. Say, what's that little four-year-old boy fell in a pond? His feet didn't touch the bottom and he began drowning. What would you do? You wouldn't hesitate you jump in and grab him you'd forget about your flesh and the cold yeah love does that love casts out all fear and the waters of personal evangelism are freezing charles spurgeon called it an irksome task and it certainly is but love conquers fear Mm -hmm. so that's that's uh that's the way i I handle my fears okay and uh i'm sure you get this in your YouTube comment section and we get it on our reviews saying that our program is a, we're just another cult talking about cults. A lot of people object and will say that biblical Christianity is a cult per se. How would, I mean, with you being on the street and just in your experience, like just off the get go, how would you immediately respond to that? Oh, I'm just going to say that the truth is always hate men, hated men love darkness rather than light because right. the deeds are evil. I find people that are antagonistic toward the things of God and call you a cult. You just got to say to them, when did you last look at pornography? And they'll say, oh, it was last night. So there's your problem. You hate the light because you love the darkness. The same reason criminals hate the police. So you grab derogatory terms and leave them about it, leave them at us because you want to justify your love of pornography and your fornication with your gorgeous girlfriend. So I don't take it to heart. When I mm-hmm. get insulted by people, I actually rejoice. Yeah. But often we, we forget about what scripture says to do. And let me tell you something that I find just wonderful. Um, atheists years ago did a horrible thing to me. They started sending around a meme that had a picture of me on it. And then using my type, type of language, the way I speak, uh, they said, if I was Uh, told by God to sacrifice my children like Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac, I would do it in a heartbeat uh, because I love God. And this was a made up meme with my picture on it with little quotes with Ray Comfort at the bottom. And so I started getting emails all over the place from around the world saying, you wretch, what a wicked man, you'd sacrifice your children. They even called the police to come around home to investigate me because I would say, the police came inside and they laughed. They said, where's your children? And I said, they're married with the children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they laughed and I showed them, I showed them all the comments yeah. from atheists. They laughed and left. But when things like that happen and you get called derogatory names, this is what I do. I look at Luke chapter six, I think it is, where Jesus said, when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, like, yeah, for my sake, he said, leap for joy, rejoice and be glad blah blah yeah i didn't mean blah blah now jesus but you know what i meant your name is written in heaven um we forget about the leap for joy jesus said leap for joy when you're persecuted and so one day i did that uh this horrible thing happened can't remember what it was it's just nasty couldn't have any control over it so i went to my office and i actually physically leapt for joy and rejoiced and the moment i hit the ground the door opened in my office and someone said someone just gave the ministry 20 grand 
And I thought, man, I wish I'd leapt higher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a joke. Oh, no. But yeah, That's so when, 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 when you get persecuted and people say you're a cult, just rejoice. They did the same thing with Jesus. Leap for joy. Do a little leap. It'll make you laugh. Yeah. No, definitely. That, there's that's some good points there. One of the things I really love about your media as of late is that you are really doing, in my opinion, a really great job of just taking current events and honestly things that a lot of a lot of people would kind of be worrisome or I would even say like freak out about uh, a little bit, but you, but you use that as a catalyst to be able to uh, talk about the gospel. So one of them recently, you had done a video about this. Uh, satanic video game by uh, nintendo switch uh, first of all get ray i mean are you are you a gamer at all uh aside no, from, not at all. no the only game i play is chasing my wife around the house <laughs> yeah um <laughs> tell us about like why did you how did you come up about like making this piece of content did someone the one somebody else bring this up to you or what made yeah, I you think, bring I think up the I, well, I read every comment usually, um, yeah. and someone brought it up. They said, why don't you this is a nasty game, and they told me where to find it, so I checked. I thought, I don't believe this. This is just mm-hmm. wicked. It should be exposed. And the Bible says in Ephesians to expose the works of darkness. Yeah. But, you know, every now and then someone will say, I think it's evil that you are promoting this stuff. And I have to write back and say, we're not promoting it. We're using it as a springboard for the gospel, as Paul did in Acts chapter 17. I says, look yeah. at the views. This has had a million views. A million people have got to hear the gospel because of the springboard of this nasty game. In the book of Acts, Paul, the apostle, quoted Greek secular godless poets. Yeah. He quoted them. Mm-hmm. Why did he do that? I mean, that's just oh, the ungodly. Yeah. But he did it as a springboard because he knew his heroes would identify it. Often we'll do that. Mm-hmm. We'll take a subject, a, a celebrity that I find contemptible, but still use that celebrity to get the attention of the ungodly or even godly because celebrity is huge. You know, mm-hmm. there are so many programs and magazines that just, you. what do celebrities drink? What do they eat? What car do they drive? What do they yeah. like? What are they dislike? People are infatuated with these celebrities. So we use that as a springboard to reach the ungodly. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had any encounters with celebrities? I know you wrote the book, What Hollywood Believes, which is one of my one of my favorite books that I purchased a long time ago. What about that? Just with being on the street? Have you ever had an encounter with anybody, quote unquote, famous? I mean, yeah. um, uh, Have you heard of Arnold Schwarzenegger? Oh, you know what? I in passing in passing. Did I tell do you hear did you hear about my encounter I had with him? No, I have not heard oh. about this. We had a short conversation. Let me share it with you. I was standing in Santa Monica. This is in the late 1990s when uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver walked past. Hmm. And it was his then wife. And I thought, well, wise men follow stars. So I'll follow these people. <laughs> and so I follow <laughs> I followed them and they went into the gap clothing store. Have you heard of the gap? Yes. So I went round to a side door, went into the gap and there I was standing in the gap for Arnold Schwarzenegger when he approached me. Now I became starstruck. He wasn't as tall as what I thought. And instead of saying, Hey, how you doing? I enjoy your movies, which I don't, but I would have thought of something like that. I just went to give them a gospel track and he just went, no, and walked on. And that mm-hmm. was the conversation I had with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty, that's a pretty intense no. Like I literally yeah, well, visualized uh, that in, in Arnold's voice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so very deep no. And his big muscles he used to have before he frizzled like the rest of us. Yeah. He could have picked me up and just snapped me. But he, <laughs> he was protecting his wife. Oh yeah, for and, sure. Uh, but God was in control. The Lord must have thought, oh, these old comfort wrecking things. And a 12-year-old boy that used to preach with us uh, on the soapbox, he had memorized all these wonderful things about Jesus in the Bible in this little blurb that lasted three minutes. Mm -hmm. He went and shared that with Maria Shriver downstairs in the gap uh, he'd followed to. And then she said to Arnold, come and listen to this. And he listened too to that blurb that he gave. Mm -hmm. And so it was a wonderful experience. But listen, to this is the power of celebrity. In those days, I would be usually get about nine or 10 people come with me every Friday night for about three years, open air preach. That was our team. The night after Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, he he came through, the next 
Friday, there were 30 people showed up for our evangelism team. Mm. <laughs> it tripled. <laughs> and so if you, want to increase your church, if you want to increase your evangelism in your church, get your team to grow bigger, just get Arnold Schwarzenegger to join the team or something. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, Andrew. Uh, Another celebrity that I got to know is uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Kirk, Kirk Cameron. Uh, yeah. Sorry for interrupting your currently scheduled programming, but did you know you can go to apologiastudios.com and become an all access member with all access membership you get exclusive content from all of Apologia Studios productions. Not to mention Coltish is an Apologia Studios production. So you'll get access to Coltish, the aftermath where Jerry and I talk together after our most recent series discussing what we thought. It's really cool. We have a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, we can't do this without the studio. It keeps the lights on. And we can't also do this without you. So please go to ApologiaStudios.com and become an all access member. Now back to the programming. So uh, Andrew, he he uh, is part of our church plant up in uh, Salt Lake City, and they go out and do evangelism every Thursday nights, and they've run across some interesting characters. One, Andrew, tell him about that. You have a guy who's who's a prophet. Uh, tell him about that. Maybe you could see if Ray has any similar stories as well, too. No, that's good. I was going to actually ask uh, Ray, Ray about this, actually, uh, in terms of the most interesting people uh, that he's ever spoken with. Well, out in Utah, there's this one man who... Uh, he doesn't say he's a prophet, right? But he does say that the things that he says could be written down like the words in the Bible. So we essentially call this man the prophet of Provo. But when speaking with these people, which I'm sure you have so much experience with this, there's always something different that's going on. And before we started this podcast, we did a prayer uh, and Rape was praying and mentioned, you know, that essentially we're, we fight not a battle of flesh and blood, but about... Uh, about these invisible powers that are around us. Like Ray, Ray, what if, what's one of the craziest experiences uh, that you've had with people that may be oppressed or possessed in a way? And how do you go about that in your conversations? How do you handle that situation? Very carefully. Um, I don't try and cast demons out of people. And there's a reason for that. I've had experience in that in the past where demons were manifest. But the reason for it is if you cast a demon out of a person that's not repentant, they're going to get seven times worse. Jesus said that. So I really don't want to do that to someone who's uh, who's non-repentant because their sin opens the door to the, to the demonic forces. Um, let me share one illustration of someone who was probably demon-possessed, but it was my fault for provoking. As Paul, I don't know if Paul was at fault when he said to that, that when he cast the demon out of that woman, all hell, quote, broke loose and he ended up in jail in the philippian jailer come the earthquake and all came but we don't know if paul did that which is right when he after many days he lost his patience with her and cast the demon out but he waited for many days i was preaching in santa monica had a crowd of about 30 or 40 people and uh, this woman called out young lady she called out the f word twice really loud and describing me and so i said to her and i shouldn't have said this i said madam can you watch your language there are ladies present that really up upset her when I said that. She says, mm -hmm. I'm a lady. I said, ma'am, you may be a woman, but you are certainly not a lady. Of that, she ran at me like a bat out of heaven and then started beating me up. Like, it wasn't the usual way that women fight. It wasn't scratch, scratch and pull. It was, <laughs> it was like <laughs> Mike Tyson's sister or something. Yeah. Anyway, she got in six punches and I was on the ground and my team pulled her off and held on to her and she said let me get my handbag and they let her go and she got in a kidney punch really hard it took two weeks of the bruising to go but she doubled my crowd she can come back anytime but it was that was totally my fault but she was probably demon possessed i would say hmm. um there are a couple of other things that i'd like to mention sure that uh that are that i think are very relevant to what we're talking about when i meet someone in an, a cult i want to find out what they're trusting in and the way I do it, and I've done it for years, is I say this, there's a knife in my back. I've got three minutes to live. How can I enter the kingdom? If I'm talking to a Jehovah's Witness, that's the language I use. Knife in my back, three minutes to live. How can I enter the kingdom? And so mm -hmm. many times I've seen them immediately flounder. They go, well, what you have, I say, come on, I've got two and a half minutes to live. I'm dying. I've got a knife and back. I want to enter the kingdom. Tell me what I should do. They say, what do you do? Uh, you really need to study and you need knowledge. I say, I haven't got time for knowledge. You need to pray. I'm already praying. I'm dying. I'm terrified. I've broken the commandments. I've committed adultery in my heart. I've looked at pornography. I've lied and stolen. Help me. What can I do to be saved? 
And they said, well, you have to live a life of, I say, I haven't got time to live a life. It's now one minute to go. And the Jehovah's Witness will say, in the end, I can't help you. Hmm. I can't help you. They don't know why. Because they're not trusting in God's grace. They're not trusting in the cross where Jesus said it is finished. Same with Mormons. You can do the same thing with Mormons. Anyone that's just said, just do the three minutes to live and put pressure on them and say, I got one minute, help me. And they'll say, I can't help you. We've got videos of it happening. Mm -hmm. So that's very effective with cults. And so from there, when someone says, I can't help you, I say, well, look, let me ask you a question. Do you think you're a good person? And they invariably say, yes, I am a good person. That's their problem. They're still trusting in their own righteousness because they're ignorant of God's righteousness. And that's when I bring in the law to annihilate their mm -hmm. self-righteousness, point them to the cross. Yeah. And the second most effective thing that I've discovered in the last five or so years, and I use it a lot, <clears throat> it's so, so very powerful. And that is, I say to the, the people I'm witnessing to, and you can see this a lot on a YouTube channel, um, do you know what death is? Mm-hmm. And they usually say, no, it's just the end of life. No, no, no. The Bible actually defines death. It tells us what death actually is. It says death is wages. And I say, well, what, wait, wages? I see. It's like a judge in a court of law looks at a criminal that's murdered three women. And the criminal says, judge, this was not a serious crime. These were prostitutes. These were the scum of the earth. I was doing society a favor. I can't be charged with murder for them. And the judge says, I'm going to show you how serious your crime is. Mm. I'm giving you the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. This is your payment. This is what you've earned. And I turn to the person and say, sin is so serious to a holy God, he's given you the death sentence. This is your wages. This mm. is what's due to you. And your death is evidence that God is deadly serious about sin. Yeah. Like the criminal, when he hears the death sentence, suddenly sees that his transgression was very serious. So sinners, when they realize what death is, suddenly see that sin may not be serious in their eyes, just steal little things, just a little bit of lust, a little fornication, mm -hmm. who doesn't fornicate? In God's eyes, it's worthy of the death sentence. Lying yeah. lips are an abomination to the Lord. And so I found that to be very, very effective. And when I share that scenario with people, almost always they will listen to the gospel and mm -hmm. want to get right with God because they've suddenly seen how serious sin is. Yeah. And, and one of the things, I'll just share a story with you very, very quickly, Ray, and you can give me your thoughts. Uh, I had a couple months ago, I was chatting with two young men. Jehovah's Witnesses finally, have finally come back out into the woodwork. They kind of disappeared for a while due to COVID. Um, I was talking to two young men, and we started off the conversation talking about Jesus and who he was. Is he God? And they were saying, no, he's Michael the Archangel. And that's me going back and forth. And all of a sudden, I just felt led to take him through the Ten Commandments. And when I went to using God's name in vain, I asked him, have you ever, in other words, when you stub your toe and instead of saying a swear word, you say Jesus Christ, both of them immediately had deer in the headlights. And I said, that's blasphemy, right? And it's like, so they're from the intellect, they are arguing in their, from the intellect that Jesus wasn't God, but they knew that using his name instead of a swear word was blasphemy. So it's like their conscience contradicted their own theology. And you, and I began to see them like really be convicted. And that's not anything that I did. It was just where the Lord led me. Did you Have you had a similar experience with someone on the street when it comes to specifically using uh, that commandment when it comes to someone from either a cultist or a different world religion? Yes, yes. And I'll just, you brought me uh, a thought to mind that I think is very relevant to what we're saying in your experience. Yeah. Um, I, I would never try and convince the Jehovah's Witness that Jesus is God. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, Peter said to Jesus, or Jesus said to Peter, who, Lord, who do, excuse me. Um, Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? Yeah. And Jesus said, uh, some say you're John the Baptist, blah, blah. And he says, um, he said, who do you say I am? And he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, the deity of Christ. Yeah. Basically is what he's saying. And then Jesus said this. Blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So my thought is 
I'm not going to try and argue intellectually who Jesus is because they've got their scriptures that they're ready. They've got their little Gatling gun ready to fire. I'm just going to shout them out under the law and let God tell them who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. When I became a Christian, I didn't know who Jesus was. I knew he was the Savior. I knew he was the Son of God. I was about a two-week-old Christian when I suddenly read in John 14 where I think one of the disciples said, show us the Father, and Jesus said, do you not yet know mm -hmm. It yeah. seemed, and it just blew me onto the floor. Let me give an illustration that uh, illustrates uh, why it blew me onto the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to sound really weird unless you're a dog lover. Um, there's my dog there. Mm -hmm. That's Sam. Yes. And I take him out every day and he gets me, <laughs> he gets me interviews. Yeah. Uh, people say, I love your dog. And I just ride up on my bike. People come up, no, I like your dog. Mm -hmm. If you're not a dog lover, you're going to think I'm weird. But I actually talk to my dog, and he talks back to me. I say, hey, doing, Sam? Good day? And, you know, she have a good sleep? It's just chatting away. He tells me when there's someone at the door. He'll tell me when he wants to eat. He'll tell me when he sees a cat. I can tell by his body language and his bark, what's going on, whether he's upset, whatever. So we have this communication thing. Now, here's my point. One of my favorite things in life, we've got a big sheepskin rug in our lounge, and living room. I lie on the sheepskin rug sideways and immediately comes round. He knows what's going to happen. He comes round to me. He lies down and I grab him by the ears, pull him up close and we have a chat. I go eye to eye with him. And I say, we had a good time today, Sam, on the bike. And when I say bike, his eyes go like that. I say, you saw a cat, didn't you? And I see him processing thoughts in his eyes. It's quite amazing. Yeah. Immediately, as soon as I lay down, his tail wags. When he lies down beside me, his tail wags because the master is coming down to go eye to eye. Mm -hmm. God came down to go eye to eye with you and me. And if that doesn't make your tail wag, something is wrong with you as a Christian. Yeah. The fact that God was manifest in the flesh just thrills my heart. The almighty God that created the sun and the moon, the stars, mm -hmm. that knows every atom intimately that makes up that whole immense sun, that God became one human being and spoke and walked on water and broke yeah. bread and raised the dead. That thrills my heart. And so evangelism for me is an overflow of that joy, mm -hmm. an overflow of the knowledge that I have of who God is who Jesus is and what he accomplished at the cross. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good. Thank you so much, Ray. And I love the fact that you just bring it back to the centricity uh, of the gospel. Cause again, I think that even people will look at the different topics that we cover and feel that they have to know every little intricacy, but in many ways it's, it's the reality is amount. It's just a matter of keeping it simple. I think of like Bruce Lee, I fear the man who's kicked the same kick a thousand times and, you know, with you bringing the law, I mean, that's essentially the same thing about how you bring conviction to someone. Uh, I think a uh, question I have real quickly, this is, uh, I was just curious about um, our friends at the Babylon Bee. Most people know about them uh, with the different funny satire articles they do uh, every day. They had an interview a while back with Elon Musk. Uh, I enjoyed the interview. A lot of people kind of gave them heat at the end of that uh, the interview where they tried to present the gospel to Elon Musk. A lot of gave him a lot of people gave him a lot of flack and you could even see it on their comment section. You did a video that was I thought was excellent, but then not only did it get a lot of good feedback, you ended up being on to actually talk with the guys in their studio. I'm just curious like what was your when you saw that video like what was your heart behind putting that constructive criticism together? And then how did that how did that become a catalyst to talk to the guys on the bee? Yeah, I love Babylon Bee. Um, I think they're a, an oasis in a world of just desert of human yeah. liberals. So just for them to say something funny, we show it to each other and we just laugh and it's oh, yeah. like a, a little consolation of what's going on. I laughed a couple so, times this morning as well, too, with something yeah, you shared. It, it's so you know, you fret yourself, but you know, you like um Lot, who was vexed. So I spend most of my life vexed by what's going on in the world and suddenly there's this funny thing that gives you a little joy in the middle of it mm -hmm. um, but when i saw what happened with elon musk i was utterly horrified at their lacking of biblical knowledge uh when it came to sharing the gospel i couldn't believe what they said because 
I could, I've always felt that Elon Musk is crying out for God. He is like Solomon on steroids. Yeah. Um, you know, vanity, vanities. His marriages are broken up. He's he's the richest man on on earth, and he's got this little house that he lives in. That's uh, that's it's like a he's Solomon's temple. Yeah. He's bought him, and he's talking about going to Mars. Mm -hmm. He's that frustrated with what's on earth and wants to go and send people to Mars. That's really a dumb idea, by the way. If I was <laughs> getting to talk to him, I'd say, look, what, instead of going to Mars, why don't you just create a big dome in a Mojave Desert in California, put air conditioning in it, and let all the homeless live in there. Yeah, And that would at least less difficult than trying to start life on Mars. We'd need the same sort of dome, whatever. Yeah. But anyway, my heart has cried out for Elon Musk, and all I needed to say to him was, Elon, what's, what's going to happen when people die? Where are you going? And let him pour his heart out. I would give my right arm, well, my right hand, uh, my pinky, to witness to Elon Musk in yeah. that situation because of who he is and the influence and the cry of his heart. Yeah. And so I I would rather build bridges than burn them. Instead of coming on and making a video saying, you guys are just crazy. What do you think you're doing? Just say, look, I understand the nervousness. Uh, look, Elon should have heard the gospel, blah, blah. And I didn't burn a bridge between me and them. They knew that they'd done something wrong because their reaction. So they invited me to come on and we had a great time. We, really neat guys mm -hmm. and uh and uh i was so pleased that uh, i didn't rail against them but, but kept our friendship which i think is very valuable we're we're too quick as christians to stand in a circle and uh have a uh, a shooting session yeah no I, I, I if you study our ministry you're very really mm -hmm. will i say anything negative about yeah. other ministries mm -hmm. there's only one i think uh one televangelist from the 90s from texas who was yeah. absolutely disgusting who would just mm -hmm. say send us a thousand dollars is this mm -hmm. all the best you can do and he is just crazy so. yeah hey what's up everyone we love that you are enjoying our content on a weekly basis but this program cannot continue and wouldn't be possible without your support so if you want to go to the cultistshow.com there is a donate tab you can either support us one time or you can become a monthly partner with us that will allow us to continue this program, allow us to continue to be salt and light to the kingdom of the cults. So please go to thecultistshow.com forward slash donate and you can support us one time or monthly. Also, make sure you check out our merchandise store. Go to shopcultish.com. You can see all of our great designs. A lot of you have gotten merchandise from us already. So again, you either go to shopcultish.com and check out all the awesome merch. Back to the show. And and I think like one of the things I even appreciate about even the interview, even with that part at the end, which a lot of people say they kind of botched the end of the interview, even Elon's response that he gave, like you saw his real humanity and his real need for Jesus. And I think you really saw even his even in his answer to how they did it at the very, very end. But I think just seeing, again, the, how you took an opportunity, which a lot of people were just venting their frustration, you saw as a way to be uh, constructive and use as a catalyst for the gospel. Andrew, uh, what, what's what's in your mind right now? Do you have questions about that or what else are you thinking about right now? Yeah, it, it, it seems to me that a big key for having a, a good Christian walk is first, of course, always like First Peter 3.15 says, separate Christ as Lord in your heart. Uh, but in terms of doing that, it's having that mind in you that is also in Christ Jesus and the form of humility. And uh, that's a great attitude to have, even in every conversation that you're having with someone else. Like you, you were also going to hell and then God saved you. So when you're speaking with anybody, have that mind in you that you want to help rescue them by preaching to them the gospel. And I love that. Uh, Ray, the Lord has used you in that way. Cause whenever I watch your videos, it's always that same consistent approach in terms of you just being a regular human being, having a conversation with people and sharing with them the gospel. And you, uh, use that the same way when talking to people, uh, from let's say Babylon B, for example, even if you were to talk to Elon Musk, it's a, it's that humble mind in a sense that makes it a little bit easier to, to share the gospel. That's kind of uh, mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah. Um, and we forget when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, uh, his motivation was love. Why did he rebuke the Pharisees? Well, you rebuke because you want the person to repent. And we don't know how mm -hmm. many of those nasty Pharisees ended up on the day of Pentecost mm -hmm. receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. We just don't know. And so I, I like to see the nastiest person as a potential sort of Tarsus. 
you know, I pray regularly for a number of atheists. Um, yeah. I pray for uh, Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins, mm-hmm. all those guys every night have done for years. The God yeah. would touch the hearts. And Richard Dawkins is pretty much on his deathbed. He's really old now. Yeah. And I just pray that he'll think about the stupidity of atheism. Atheism is so intellectual suicide. And an atheist believes the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything. Mm-hmm. That's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And they sit back and think they're intellectual, just as the Bible says, pro- professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They profess yeah. they're wise. Mm-hmm. It's such intellectual stupidity that nothing wasn't there was nothing in the beginning. An yeah. atheist believes that nothing was the creative force that made everything. Mm-hmm. Nothing can't create anything because it's nothing. It's crazy. Yeah. So when we think about spiritual warfare and specifically just and you probably see it up front, given that your ministry is based in California. Um we're in a we're pretty much in a free fall into neo neo paganism, like just just with our culture in general. Do you think there's a danger though to, for people to be able, even though it says our battle is not against flesh and blood, to make that the battle? I mean, you sometimes you see the people out in Santa Monica, or even the pictures of the, the, some of the people that seem intimidating that you're witnessing or that are hostile. Do you think there's a temptation lines a lot of times for Christian to have the focus be on the person? versus the spiritual warfare behind it? Yeah, I keep in mind that I'm wrestling not against flesh and blood, and I, I can see it so often when I'm coming to the gospel, uh, when I'm witnessing, you see on the videos, and I've actually edited a lot out where I'm talking to someone, I say, now let me share the gospel with you. We broke God's law and Jesus came and paid the fine. At that moment, the person will go like this. They'll be distracted by a bird 100 yards away, and I have yeah. to say, Listen to me. Uh, this is very important. I want you to listen. And often I have to do that because there's distractions. And I know that it's a demonic battle that we face. And we've got to remember that, but we mustn't be focused on it. Right. Just keep your mind on the person because you are talking to flesh and blood. You're appealing to a human being that you want to be saved. So, um, yeah, I, I've got in the back of my mind that it's a spiritual battle, but I'm very, very aware that this person desperately needs to get saved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then um, I remember I just was in uh, going through a couple of your videos There's a playlist and it's kind of bouncing around to different thoughts and different ideas. One of the videos that bounced across was about, I think it was in New York and there was somebody who is a, either the a warlock or a wizard who would heckle you, but you create a friendship with him. Uh, tell us about that just really quickly, if you could, because I, I think it's really relevant given we deal with a lot of new age topics and we try and reach out to people similar to, to, to that person that you encountered. Yes, this was way back when I was in New Zealand and the city of Christchurch, my hometown, city of 350,000 people. I began opening a preaching and I befriended a guy there who was known as the wizard. He was very well known, a great speaker. Um very anti-Christian. He looked on me as a low-down Bible-bashing Baptist, even though he wasn't a Baptist. He was a high Anglican. He wasn't born again, Mm. totally offended by the gospel. And I thought to myself, if Jesus could call Judas a friend as he betrayed him, I can make this guy my friend. So I began giving him birthday presents, Christmas presents, invited at home for lunch or dinner, was dinner. And uh, we became great friends to a point where he he was a nationally known or internationally known figure he would get 300 people pack around his ladder to hear him speak regularly he was Mm -hmm. really funny he would say things like why do we pay our doctors when we're sick they've got no incentive to make us well we should pay them ten dollars a month when we're well and then they'd have an incentive to keep us well Mm -hmm. just a lot of really fun things like that that made you laugh yeah and uh he would allow me to get up on his ladder and preach to his crowd of 300 he'd say come on right come and share a word Hmm. and it's because we were friends and so uh we can do that with anyone you know i i regularly give out do you know what in and out cards are in and out hamburgers they're yeah best burgers every day i give out cards to people like if someone does an interview i say here's a couple of in and out cards for lunch today just as a thank you for doing this interview and one thing that i absolutely love doing and i do it every day as I go straight into this college and I ride around until I find someone to witness to and who wants to come on camera. Invariably, most people say, no, I'd rather not. I says, because you're shy? And I say, yeah, I'm really shy. I say, well, no, you're not. You're talking to a complete stranger, me. I'll give you a couple of in and out cards if you give me an interview as a thank you. And they mm-hmm. say, no. And then I say, well, here's the cards anyway. 
and you should see their reaction. I wish I'd get it on camera, but I can't because they haven't got their permission. Yeah. You can have the cards anyway. Their eyes just light up. I say, what? Thank you so much. Because that co- that world out there is very cold. Mm-hmm. And so when, when you show love for, for a stranger, it's very, very powerful. And that's why Christians should let their light shine. Let their love shine to non-Christians. Give away things. Yeah. Give away, keep a few gift cards on you and just give them to someone for no reason. And then give them a card, say, check out. And when I always give them my YouTube channel uh, mm. card and say, you might like to check it out, whatever. But it's very powerful to, to let your light shine in that respect. Mm. Wow. No, thank you. What, what do you, what are you thinking, Andrew? Yeah, I have, I have an in, interesting question for you because we were talking earlier and uh, you, you mentioned, which it's, it's absolutely true, that everyone fears death, essentially. Maybe there's that runoff person who doesn't, you know what I mean? But uh, regardless, uh, I mean, that's what God says about people. So why do you think that the culture that fears death is also a culture of death, right? Like thinking about abortion and a life of non-procreation or gender confusion. Uh, Why is a culture that's so afraid of death so pro-death, you think, Ray? Well, that's a good question. Um, they've got no answer to death. It really is the grim reaper you get. It's just the, 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 the evil and the weirdness of human nature. And let me qualify that, that. I don't believe anyone is sane until they come to Christ based on the Bible. You talk to a psychologist, they can't define sanity. There's no de- definition of sanity in psychology. If, if, if he thinks you're nuts, you talk to your dog, he talks back to you, you're crazy. <laughs> We need to lock you up. When we come to Christ, we receive the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Mm -hmm. The man who was possessed, Legion, when he was delivered of his demons, he was fully clothed and in his right mind. Yeah. Conversion puts us in our right mind. So we've got a world that's absolutely insane. Uh, I would not watch a horror movie. Today's horror movies are just absolutely disgusting because you're filling yourself with images that are kind of come back and horrify you. It's just death and darkness. And uh, so I think it is a culture of death because men love darkness and not realizing that the darkness they love is very, very real. That death is, 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 uh, Satan had, has dominion over those if they serve him. Yeah. Uh, it says he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's a word of permission. So they're in the kingdom of darkness. They love the darkness. They revel in darkness. And part of that darkness is that culture of death. And when we come to Christ, everything changed. You know, when I was saved, the second I was changed, I became pro-life, pro-one man, one woman, because God wrote his law upon my heart and caused mm-hmm. me to walk on the statutes. So yeah. what a wonderful gospel we have that could transform people's minds and hearts. Oh, definitely. And again, I, I, that's so good. And I, again, Ray, I really appreciate you making uh, the time here real quick. I'm just uh, curious. You've had a lot of encounters, a lot of stories throughout the year. I remember really adamantly uh, watching through, I ordered all the DVDs forever ago of way at the master uh, a long time ago, but um, do you have any like stories? Do you have a story that you maybe have never told an encounter that you maybe never told anyone that's like very unique that maybe you could just share with us one, just any, anyone that comes to mind. I know you have the go-to stories, but is there anything that's like kind of unique? That's a unique story that you haven't told anyone. No, um, I'm a blabbermouth. But this, is story, <laughs> this is one that, that uh, just, I find amazing. And that is a guy named Mario. I don't know if you watched the video. <clears throat> it's called Mario. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's, he's, I don't know if it's called Mario. That was the name of the guy, but he just started weeping. Um, as I was talking to him, he was a young guy, very handsome. Yeah. He's just uh, uh, standing by a tree about half a mile away. And I went past him on my bike. I thought, oh, will I stop? Will I? Uh, I will. I turn around. I thought he'll say no. Do you want to do an interview? He says, yeah, straight away. And he was very proud, self righteous, almost arrogant. And as we went through the commandments into the gospel, I noticed a tear drop from his eye. You can't see it on camera because of the angle. It just ran down his cheek and then another one. And then it becomes evident on camera that he's weeping. But when I saw that first tear, I was horrified because this guy was weeping over his own sins. And I didn't want to wreck this. Mm. 
Yeah. It's like when your wife's having a baby and the doctor says, you take over. You say, hey, no, I don't want to, you know, break this. This is, this yeah. is life. Uh-huh. And so I was in fear and trembling, but it went very, very well. But I just says, um, are you, are you sorry for your sins? And he just says, yes. And he's just weeping his heart out. And, and I said, do you want to repent and come to Christ? He says, yes, like that. And in five minutes earlier, he was arrogant and self-righteous mm-hmm. and yet, the Holy Spirit came upon him so evidently. And that's one that just thrills my heart. And often when I go out on my bike, which I will be soon, I look at my dog and say, okay, hope you see a cat. I hope God brings a Mario to me today and pray that happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we need more Mario's people who will be aware of their sins and have genuine contrition. Yeah, no, definitely. And then, um, yeah, maybe as we wrap up here, I mean, our, I mean we have a, a broad v- audience here. Um, you know, we deal with it specifically like so the cult, new age, world religions, but a lot, do you have just, I mean, off the get go, like any final words that you have just for our audience? I mean, kind of people are familiar with you and your ministry and we're talking about evangelism with the cults. Do you have kind of any final words or anything on your heart you'd like to share as we wrap up here? Last words? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> it's my last words. Um, yeah, last actually, interview with you ever. <laughs> yeah. You heard it here first. Yep. Wow. Um, don't listen to your fears. Don't let discouragement come upon you. The word discouragement is very interesting. Discouragement. Satan wants to discourage you. Take your discourage or take your courage from you. Bible says of Jesus, he was never discouraged. He shall not fail nor be discouraged. Keep it joy because the joy of the Lord is your strength and imitate my wife and my myself when we don't watch our rugby team when we know they're going to lose. Mm-hmm. You say, what are you talking about? The best rugby team in the world, the All Blacks, when we watch it, we get stressed if we're watching live. And stress is not good for someone my age. I'm coming up to 73, and if I have stretch, I'll just drop dead. Stress. It's, mm-hmm. it's a killer. And I cannot watch our, our football team, rugby team play without having to leave the room. I get so stressed. So Sue and I <laughs> find out if we won. We found out we won. We'll watch the replay knowing we won. And you say, doesn't that take the excitement out of it? Yes, but it has a great benefit. We never get stressed through the whole game. The other team hoot and holler when they score. We just smile because we know in the last five seconds we score and we win. And so the Christian needs never get distressed. Never do we suffer from stress because we know that we win. God wins over the devil. Righteousness wins over sin and God's kingdom is coming to this earth and God's will is being done on this earth as it is in heaven. It's going to be done. And so always keep your eye on the victory. Jesus shall not fail nor be discouraged. Why was he never discouraged? Because scripture says he shall not fail. God is for us. Nothing can be against us. We win. Therefore, keep your peace and joy, though there's threats of atomic warfare, threats of worldwide starvation, threats of violence, take no notice. God's in total control. Nothing takes them by surprise. We, by surprise, we win in the end. So keep your joy. Excellent. All right. Well, Ray, I appreciate you really taking the time here and I'm sure you've got a busy day ahead of you. So again, thank you so much for coming on. And if you got, if you all enjoyed this conversation, make sure you let us know uh, what you thought. Please leave a comment on our social media. Oh, one last thing, right? What's what are you thinking? Livingwaters.com is yes. the website. <laughs> Livingwaters.com. That's where people can and find out YouTube, more about you. YouTube channel too. It's just it's Ray Comfort YouTube or Living Waters YouTube. You can find that. Okay. Appreciate that. I got to, got to jump that right. Did the car before the horse there a little bit. Uh, definitely a great website. A lot of great resources, a lot of uh, great track. Just real quickly. What's have you, I remember I, you had the million dollar bill. You had, I remember using on the street, the trick card, the two, it was like the blue and pink slip where you make them different from each other. Have you made any interesting tracks as of lately? Or what's the most interesting yeah, track you've ever made? We've made lots of them. Um, you can see all the tracks. Um, they're all unique. People want more. Non-Christians ask for more. So you can just see them by just clicking on store and looking at tracks on livingwaters.com. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. And I appreciate you all listening in. And as always, a program like Cold just cannot continue without your support. So if you feel led to support our ministry, help us to have more conversations like this with our friend Ray, uh, please go to thecultishshow.com. There is a donate tab. You can either do a one-time donation or become a monthly partner with us. All that being said, we will talk to you all next week on Cultish, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you all soon.
Hey, everyone, we hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ray Comfort from livingwaters.com. So I hope you all enjoyed that conversation. As a reminder, uh, the at, through the end of the year, the 31st, you can make a tax-deductible donation at thecultishow.com forward slash donate. You can become a, uh, do a one-time donation, or there is the option if you want to do a one-time donation, but also become a monthly partner with us going into 2023. Andrew, just real quickly, tell everyone about what that donation will do uh, in regards to helping cultists be released on a regular basis. Yeah. So you always see Jerry in my face, but there's also other faces behind the scene that actually work very hard to make this podcast continue. One is Gabe, who's recording us right now, probably looking at us on the screen going, shaking his head. Why you say my name? But there's many people here in the studio that help make this podcast happen and we can't do it without your support so again we thank you for the support you have given us and yeah we're excited for 2023 awesome so thank you again so much for listening i hope you all have a great happy and safe new year and we cannot wait to go into 2023 uh grab the bull by the horns and take on the kingdom of the cults once again and please consider partnering with us the cultishow.com forward slash donate thank you all again and talk to you all next year